John chapter 3 is where we're going to be beginning tonight in the study of the gospel of John, the gospel of belief. Uh, we spent some time looking at the prologue, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18, giving us a preview of everything that we're going to be studying uh, throughout this book, the themes of it, and uh, setting the stage. And then we've watched the ministry of Jesus begin to develop. Of course, starting with John the Baptist, and then he is passing things on to Jesus, even passing disciples on to Jesus, as we've seen in chapter 1. And that process will continue uh, through chapter 3 as well. And then in chapter 2, we, we were introduced to his first miracle, a semi-public miracle. And we talked about the importance of the first miracle, setting the stage, sending a message about what he was here to do and, and what he was about. Then last week, we studied in John chapter 2, his first Passover that we read about in the Gospel of John and uh, his cleansing of the temple and his conversation about the temple of his body. And so where we want to pick up this evening or whenever you may be watching this is in John chapter 3. And this will begin a series of many conversations, many um, extended conversations between Jesus and individuals. And so we're going to look in, at John chapter 3 verses 1 through 10 because some of the uh, the content of John 3, 1 through 10, we want to make sure that we take the time to address it adequately and um, not necessary and not overwhelm us at the same time. And so if uh, I, I contemplated John 3, 1 through 21, because that's really the first section uh, of this chapter, but decided to stop with verse 10 because I wanted to make sure that we could uh, go through and give treatment the way that we should. So let's begin by reading the text together. It's always important that we read the word of God together, and then we will begin to try and unpack the meaning of the passage. John chapter three, beginning in verse one. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. And you, hear it, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to them, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things. And so as we think about this particular passage, this interaction with Nicodemus, one of the things that we really need to do is actually back up and read a couple of more verses in chapter 2 where we left off, verses 23 to 25. Now remember this. It says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. And we talked about how individuals were coming to Jesus, but their faith was somewhat shallow, perhaps only because of the signs, similar to what we're going to see in John chapter 6, there Jesus will confront them and say, you're only following me because I filled your stomachs, and that's why you're here again. And what you should be thinking about is the bread of life which comes down from heaven, that if a man eat of it, he'll never die. And I am that bread of life, is what Jesus will say in John chapter 6. So we're looking at a context where people see the signs, and they're coming to Jesus, but their faith is somewhat surface, if not superficial. And the text says that Jesus is able to look, obviously, on the heart, being, being omniscient, and to see the legitimacy or the illegitimacy of an individual's faith. Now, what's interesting is when Nicodemus comes, you see the chapter break here, I think, is, um, you know, chapter breaks are good and bad. Uh, they help us with navigating the text as we see it so that we can quickly recall and point people to a text so that we can follow along together. But at the same time, sometimes these chapter headings are really hard to place, and sometimes they hinder our understanding of the text, watching the flow, because we look at chapters and we say, okay, I studied this chapter, now on to chapter 3, and it's completely detached from what's before it. But if you notice, you have individuals coming to Jesus because of his signs, and Jesus 
is not committing himself to them because their faith is superficial. Now, what we're going to see in John chapter 3 with Nicodemus is a prime example of that. Because we have Nicodemus coming to Jesus and saying, "What we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So he's coming to them based upon some of the same, re based upon the same reason that the individuals in chapter 2, verses 23 to 25 are coming to Jesus. Okay? And it will see as this discussion progresses, that his understanding of who Jesus is, what he is about, the message that he brings, is also very insufficient and shallow. Now, one of the interesting things about Nicodemus is that we see him three times in this book. We see him here in this conversation with Jesus. We see him in John chapter 7 when he kind of semi comes to the defense of Jesus before the Sanhedrin council. And then in John chapter 19, verses 38 and 39, in helping Joseph of Arimathea, with the burial of the body of Jesus. And so he's a very interesting individual. So he says, now there was a man of the Pharisees. Now, this is another subtle wordplay. Look at the end of chapter two, verse 25. For he himself knew what was in man. Now there was a man. Okay. So Jesus understands who Nicodemus is and what he's, the reason for which he is coming to Jesus. And he knows what it is that Nicodemus needs the most. And so there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a, I believe it was a Greek name, a predominantly Greek name that was transliterated over into um, the name for Hebrew and Aramaic. It simply means victory over the people. It was a somewhat common name uh, in the time of Jesus. Now, the text says that he's a Pharisee. You remember the Pharisees, they're the strictest of the sects of the Jews. There were, according to Josephus, roughly 6,000 Pharisees around the time of Christ. And uh, they developed during the intertestament period. You see, during the intertestament period, the children of Israel, as the Old Testament, as Old Testament history closes out, the children of Israel are allowed to return home from what had been first for the 10 northern tribes of Syrian captivity, and then for the southern tribes along with the 10 northern tribes of Babylonian captivity, and then Persia took over for the Babylonians, and the philosophy of how to deal with subjects from other nations changed with the Medo-Persian Empire, and so they allowed the Jews to return home. You read about that in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Now, what you had was, you had the people of Israel that were under the control and the rule of a foreign nation, and they would continue to be. There were, there were pockets of independence along the way, the Maccabean Revolt and others, but they would be under the Medo-Persian rule. They'd be under the Greek rule. They were under Roman rule at the time of the New Testament. And so the question became, how do we live out our faith? How does what God expects of us in the law, how, how can we do it and be faithful to it when we're under the control of a pagan government? And so these different groups had different ideas. So you had the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Herodians, um, the Essenes, the Zealots, they all were different schools of thought about how faithful children of Israel should interact with oppressive ruling governments. And so the Pharisees were somewhat champions of their day because they, the word Pharisee most likely means to separate or the separate ones. And so <clears throat> they basically made it their goal to preserve and to protect the faith that had been delivered to them by God through Moses. And so it, it seems they may have even been descended from the Hasidic Jews or the pious ones, a break off or a shoot of them. And so they were very zealous for the law and they were very, very zealous for their traditions. By the time you come to the days of Jesus, they have completely been corrupted. I don't, um, as far as their inception and their beginning, I don't know for certain if they were corrupt from the beginning, but they had lost focus by the time of Jesus. There's no doubt about that. Um, we're, the law says you can only travel this distance. And so what does that mean? How do you determine the starting point? How do you start? How do you determine the ending point? Uh, when the law says that you can't work on the Sabbath day, what does that mean? And so they address a million different scenarios and a, a million different technicalities to go along with each scenario. They were trying to be faithful to the law and trying to do what God wanted them to do but eventually they began to miss the point of what God wanted them to do. And that's why Jesus um, is very vocal and very much against the 
group of the Pharisees. So Nicodemus is one of these Pharisees, and it says he is a ruler of the Jews. What this has reference to is that he's a member of the Sanhedrin Council. You can see this again in chapter 7 and verse 50 when he comes to the defense of Jesus um, <clears throat> before the Sanhedrin Council. He seems to be a member of that Sanhedrin Council. Now, the Sanhedrin Council was kind of like their Supreme Court, their ruling uh, individuals of that day. Uh, it, it had roots, obviously, in the 70 elders or the 70 leaders ordained by Moses in the book of Exodus, uh, would have gone through some changes, as institutions many times will do. Uh, their return from captivity, they would have, you know, reestablished and redone some things, of course, with pockets of freedom in the Maccabean Revolt, uh, and then going back under Roman oppression, things would have changed a little bit more. The Sanhedrin at the time of Christ was composed largely of Sadducees who were the priestly sect, okay? And there were some Pharisees, the separate, the separate ones, because they were considered to be the champions of the people, the common people, and so representatives of them, and also scribes, experts in the law. And so it was comprised of about 71 to 72 individuals, and um, depending upon understanding of high priests and who was, holding the, who was holding the priesthood that year, Jewish high priest, Roman high priest, whatever it may be. Um, all that goes back to the Intertestament period. It doesn't necessarily determine how we understand this text. It's just a nerd, nerd like me finds it interesting. So <clears throat> anyway, he's a ruler of the Jews. And so this is a very significant moment that one of the highest leaders in the Jewish religion is approaching Jesus. Now, this is what he says. This man came to Jesus by night. Now, why did he come by night? The truth is, we really just don't know, okay? There have been about four different plausible possibilities as to why he comes by night. Number one, because he's a busy man, Jesus is a busy man, and it's the only time that's convenient for him to get together. Uh, number two, because he's a leader of the Jews, and he can't see, he can't be seen during the day to be having a conversation with Jesus, and people think that this is some kind of an endorsement of who Jesus is. Uh, number three, many of the rabbis discussed the, how they would stay up late into the night studying and discussing and debating the law with one another. And so maybe it was a common time for teachers in Israel to get together. And so maybe that's why he approaches them. Some people see it more in a spiritual sense. He comes to Jesus in the cover of night because he is in the darkness of sin. Uh, it's very similar to the way some people interpret John chapter 13 and verse 30. Uh, when describing Nick, or describing Judas as he goes out to betray Jesus, there's just this small sentence at the end of it that says, and it was night. It was night. Now, that phrase is just a little bit peculiar because, of course, it would have been nighttime. And so is it that he's playing on that? Is it here that he's coming by night and there's going to be a discussion of darkness and light a little bit later in John chapter 3? I don't know. The truth is we just don't know why he comes by night. But the most common sense explanation is that he's covering his tracks, but at the same time, also it would have been one of the few times, one of the few segments of the day where he was free enough to even approach Jesus to talk to him. So this is his assessment. He says to him, Rabbi, which is a very interesting assessment because Jesus, as was attested later in this book, chapter 7 and verse 15, and it's not argued by Jesus that Jesus was not a formally trained individual, not a doctor in the law, so to speak, or an expert, um, <clears throat> which is one of the things that amazed people about Jesus, that he had such an understanding and such a knowledge, but yet he had never been through formal education in the sense of gone and studied under a famous rabbi, the equivalent roughly of a PhD for us today as Americans. And so <clears throat> he comes to him and he calls him rabbi. And so by calling him rabbi, he's calling him, in essence, he's saying to him as an equal instructor or teacher. Whereas other individuals wouldn't have offered him that respect, he offers him that term of respect. This is what he says. We know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him number of different things to unpack here. When he says, we know, who is we? Some individuals have thought that Nicodemus had a small group of people that came with him in this discussion with Jesus, and we're just not told about them. Possible. Not likely, but possible. Um, <clears throat> some people see it as 
Jesus is speaking for the entire Sanhedrin. This entire Sanhedrin has had discussion about Jesus, and they are all in agreement that who Jesus is is pretty hard to ignore. That is, he's at least come from God. That's not a statement that says you're the Messiah. It just means that you're someone that God has chosen, and that, like a prophet of the Old Testament. Um, seeing him as a man of God, not necessarily as the son of God, but as a servant of God that he is using in a special way. So who is the we under the discussion? It could be all the Sanhedrin. It could be just those group, just a group of people that kind of have had discussions with Nicodemus and they seem to be along the same lines of saying, look, he's got to be from God. How else do you explain the signs? There and this is an interesting thing about the miracles of Jesus. When you study the miracles of Jesus, one of the things that you see, and again, 37 of them in the New Testament that we have recorded, there will be discussion and individuals will try and say, he performed this miracle by perhaps Matthew chapter 12, the power of the devils or the demons. But no one will ever deny the fact that a miracle has been performed. That tells you something about the validity of, of the miracle. They have to find some other way because the miracle is incontrovertible. It's, or as N.B. Hardin used to say, is ungetoverable. There is no, no way around it. It's a miracle. And so in Nicodemus, to a degree, you have a sense of honesty. He's saying, I'm see these, we see these miracles and there's no other explanation. Nobody could do this unless God was with him. And so he's honest in that sense. Now he's going to struggle with some things that are said here in just a moment, but he's at least intellectually honest enough and even morally honest enough to admit and assess the situation and say, there's only one explanation here. He's got to be from God. Now to what degree, to what extent, we don't know. And that may be why he's coming to Jesus to figure out who he is exactly to what degree or extent he is from God. So <clears throat> then in verse three, Jesus utters these famous words. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, I've got to be honest with you. For a long time, when I studied John 3, that seemed strange to me. Not what he's teaching, um, not the idea of being born again, new birth. That makes perfect sense, okay? It seems a little abrupt. It, it seems John or Nicodemus comes to Jesus and says, we know you come from God because we can see the signs. And Jesus says, oh, yeah, you got to be born again. It just seems a little bit off balance. There doesn't seem to follow this discussion about those miracles and a connection to, ident to the identity of Jesus and the way that it follows in some other texts, like maybe John 6. But I think what Jesus is doing here is he's going right at the heart of the matter if you go back up to chapter two, verses 23 to 25, you've got people following him somewhat superficially because of his signs. And here comes Nicodemus and says, we've seen your signs. And Jesus said, Hey, but the signs are indicative of what? The kingdom of God. And I'm here to tell you that unless you are born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. Now the kingdom of God to the Jews that, I mean, that was the, the end all be all. That was what would happen at the end of the age, the Messianic age, as they understood it, not, not the way we would understand it in Christianity, but the way they understood it. And so they believe by their heritage, being a physical descent, being a physical descent from Abraham, um, that that made them a part of the kingdom. And so to look at a, at a Jew, much less one of the leading teachers of the Jewish nation and say, hey, you've got to be born again if you want to ever see the kingdom of God, even though he believes by natural birth that he is a descendant of Abraham and has been faithful to the law, that that makes him automatically a part of the kingdom of God. You can see how radical what Jesus is saying is. He's looking at one of the most accomplished men in the Jewish religion and saying, you got to drop it all. You've got to start all over again. You've got to be born again. If you want to be in the kingdom of God, your ticket is not ticket is not punched into the kingdom of God because of your physical heritage and lineage and because of your good deeds, you've got to be born again if you ever want to see the kingdom of God, to see, to experience, to enjoy is the idea. So Nicodemus asked this question. How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? 
two ideas are about what Nick about what Nicodemus is saying here. One, the most literal is that Nicodemus is just really confused by it, saying, "What do you mean, be born again? I I can't do that. I mean, I didn't really have any choice in the first birth. So how can I be?" It's possible he's thinking literally, physically, about birth. Other individuals would see this as a figurative interpretation that he's saying, in essence, I can't start. What do you mean? I can't start over again. I can't go back to nothing. This is similar to what Paul would say in Philippians chapter 3, that he counted everything as loss. He went all the way back down to the ground and gave it all away. and went all the way back down to the ground and began to trust in Christ instead of himself for his security. Um, to be honest with you, I don't know exactly what he means here. Uh, either one, I think, has possibilities and probabilities. Um, he's certainly perplexed by what he means to be born again. And I think if I had to choose, he's prob he probably means literally here because Jesus has not offered a full explanation of what it means to be born again. And that's going to follow here in verse 5. So I think he's probably more on the literal side. And so <clears throat> Jesus says to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now there is a further explanation. You see similar phrases, you see, but it's just expounded upon a little bit further, that to be born again means to be born of the water and the Spirit. Now, I probably don't have to tell you that most people are familiar with Christianity, familiar with the, the teaching of being born again. But what it means to be born of the water and spirit is, one, is a subject that is pretty hotly debated. Um, one of the first things I think we have to acknowledge is the connection between water and spirit, the Holy Spirit under discussion here. I think there's certainly an allusion to Ezekiel 36. I don't think there's any way around that where God is speaking to the children of Israel through Ezekiel in the, in the section of Ezekiel where hope is beginning to build. He's been preaching to the captives and things are turning around and he's saying, I'm going to bring you back to the land and, and wash you with clean water from in essence, wash you from your idolatry. And I'm going to put a heart in you that desires to obey me as opposed to their, their hard hearts that had led them into idolatry and ultimately into captivity. And so <clears throat> I think there's certainly some thought process, some connection between John 3 and principle and Ezekiel 36. Now, when it comes to this discussion of these two elements, the water and the spirit, there's really not any debate that the spirit under discussion here is the Holy Spirit. But what does it mean by water? Some individuals believe that what's under discussion here is that there are two births, that, the, that to be born of the water is to, in essence, when, when a mother goes into labor, her water breaks. And so it's a physical birth. So to be born of the water, you have to be born physically, and you have to be born spiritually. That just doesn't seem to make any sense. No, the, the, we don't have any documentation of Jewish writers speaking of it that way. It, it just doesn't fit. OK, uh, it, it doesn't make sense about what's going on, what it means to be born again. That, that just, it just doesn't fit. Um, water always was involved and had a cleansing element to it. OK, under the law, you had water for purification. Uh, we use water to clean dishes. Water has a is associated with a purifying element, at least. Now, <clears throat> in my honest and studied opinion, what he has reference here is baptism. And that has been a pretty consistent understanding. When you follow some of the earliest of church leaders, they almost universally had this understanding that Jesus is referencing baptism, that the water here under discussion are the waters of baptism. And it makes sense because at the end of chapter 3 and on into chapter 4, when Jesus learned now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, even though Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, that is, Jesus did not physically go through the process of baptizing someone. And there are multiple reasons for that, but we'll talk about that more when we get into chapter four. <clears throat> 
But, so to be born of the water and the spirit, it's very similar to the Bible will use another image in discussing baptism in the same way. You've got a death, a burial, and a resurrection. So you've got a, a new creation, a, a new life, being born again out of that water. You're going down into your death and then you're raised. It, it speaks of it as a resurrection to stand again, the idea of being born again. And so <clears throat> to be born of the water and the spirit is most likely a reference to baptism. I think it's very hard to escape that. The individuals who try to escape that, they have a foundational assumption about baptism that if they would go back and re-examine that foundational assumption, they reason from the assumption forward. Instead of questioning their assumption first and then reasoning forward, they reason from the assumption forward. And their assumption is that baptism has no connection whatsoever to salvation in the sense that it's something that should be done after an individual is saved. And because of that assumption that it's a sacrament, that it's something that you're publicly identifying with Jesus, therefore, when they read any text about baptism or about water, they have to interpret it based on that understanding because they have a presupposition and a preconceived notion that baptism has nothing to do with the salvation of the soul of the individual. However, when you look at what the New Testament teaches, when you really even break down grammatically speaking, how Acts 2.38 is composed, Acts 22 and verse 16, 1 Peter 3, and there are multiple layers in 1 Peter 3, the grammar of it, the type, anti-type of it, um, so many different things. That There is a connection that a person, <laughs> baptism is essential for the salvation of the individual. I mean, that it's there. So, what does he mean to be born of the water and the spirit? That's what it means to be born again. He's giving a further explanation. To be born of the water and the spirit's involvement in the conversion of the individual, of bringing forth the new individual, the cleansing the the individual, and the putting on of the new man. Uh, there are two other parallel texts that might help here. And it's even by those who would deny baptism as essential for salvation, they will cite these two texts and understand the comparisons and that there are connections between John 3, 5, and that those two passages are Ephesians 5 and verse 26, where Jesus, where Paul is speaking of the church, saying that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Or in Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, according to his mercy he saved us not by works of righteousness done by us but by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the holy spirit so what you see in all three of these passages when you if you take a piece of paper and you write john 3 5 on the left side ephesians 5 26 in the middle and titus 3 and verse 5 on the right and then you put three words underneath each in John 3, you have first word water, second word spirit, third word kingdom of God. Enter the kingdom of God. In the middle category, Ephesians 5 and verse 26, you see the washing of water. You see the word, by the word or through the word. And then you see cleanse, that he might sanctify and cleanse her. So cleansed. Then in Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, you see the washing of regeneration, the renewal of the Holy Spirit. He saved us. And when you sit and you write those things down in that chart and you look straight across, what do you see as a consistent theme in each of those three lines? You see water, washing, and sanctifying cleanser with the washing of water, the washing of regeneration, spirit, Washing of water by the word, Ephesians 5, verse 26. Renewal of the Holy Spirit, Titus 3 and verse 5. Enter the kingdom of God, John 3 and verse 5. Cleansed, Ephesians 5 and verse 26. Saved, Titus 3 and verse 5. There is this, you see this connection start taking place. 
And so that this understanding of this passage is not inconsistent. It's very consistent with the other texts of the New Testament. And another one that might bring even more clarity is 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13, where by one spirit we are all baptized water into one body. Okay? So, <clears throat> to be born of the water and the spirit, to go through the process of the new birth, a person must be baptized. That's the idea. And a number of individuals, if you just, again, as we said before, when you stay in the context, baptism is in this context. When you look at just what happens in this section of the book, the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, you've got the baptism of John. You see people being baptized. In John chapter 4, you see Jesus and his disciples baptizing. It fits within the direct context around John 3 three through five, that this is a discussion of baptism, okay? So, it places the importance of being born again, and to be born again is to be born of the water, to be baptized, and born of the Spirit. Notice the connection, the coordinating conjunction, and to be born of the water and the Spirit. His instruction, his changing, his coming and dwelling within the individual, Ephesians 1, and so forth. Now, with that being said, <clears throat> Jesus, still in this explanation to Nicodemus, says, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. That is, you beget what you are. Human beings beget human beings. A dog begets a dog. Um, flesh begets flesh. Physical birth. If you want to be born again, you want to have a spiritual birth, it's going to be the work of God, the Holy Spirit. So, <clears throat> then he says this to follow up. After the explanation, he says, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. This should not cause you any problem. This should not be all that difficult. And, and what's interesting is the word he uses here for you is plural. In its original construction, it's plural. That you must be born again. Now, again, this is going to be very hard for Nicodemus because he has placed his security in God on his lineage, that he's a Jew, and his adherence to the law, his works. And to be told that that doesn't matter, if he wants to see the kingdom of God, he's got to be born again. A work of God is hard for him to swallow. And so Jesus even further says, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. His illustration here is simple. So you look at the wind. How many people have ever actually seen wind with their naked eye? We can feel it. When it blows against us, we can feel that sensation. We can see the effects of it. It will move the trees, or it might blow against our car very hard and so we have to kind of fight back against the wind it can move the car a little bit in essence we can feel the we can see and feel the effects of wind but we cannot see it with the naked eye okay now that which is born or excuse me the wind blows where it wills then he makes the connection to so is everyone who's born of the spirit when a person is saved no one sees the holy spirit come upon no one sees the holy spirit's operation on that individual no one sees the Holy Spirit coming to dwell within the individual. No one sees the individual sins being cut away by the blood of Jesus being applied to their soul. But you can see the effects of it. You can see a person with the joy that comes with salvation. You can see the transformed life that comes with salvation. That's what he's saying. He's offering this fuller explanation to Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is just as perplexed by it. In verse 9, he says this. How can these things be? It's very hard. Now, for those of us who have grown up and, and Christianity has been, been in existence for 2,000 plus years, and the message of the gospel and the works of the law not being able to justify that, that just makes sense to us. But it's complete shell shock to a lead teacher in Israel who has spent the majority of his life, he's, he's got to be at least in the latter part of the middle stage of his life to the latter part of his life, to be able to sit on the Sanhedrin Council, you have to meet qualifications. 
And so <clears throat> to hear that all of that is being turned on its head, that's just a tough pill to swallow. And so he's just having a hard time processing it all. And Jesus offers him a rebuke. And he says, are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Now, what does he mean by that? Now, obviously, it's the rebuke that you're a teacher in Israel. You're a significant. You know, he calls him the teacher of Israel. You're a very, you're a leading thinker in Israel. Why is this so perplexing to you? Because the idea of God changing an individual, it, it's found throughout the Old Testament. Again, we, we looked at Ezekiel 36. The idea of a rebirth, so to speak, is found. The concept is found throughout the Old Testament. Why is it so perplexing to you that I'm saying to you that you have to be born again? It's something that you should have picked up. And so Jesus, in this interaction with Nicodemus, is, it's interesting to watch Jesus interact with people because he keeps them off balance, so to speak. Um, they come with one idea in mind, and he has a way of radically shifting that, and we need to keep that in mind as we come to Jesus. Watch preconceived notions because rarely does Jesus fit into our preconceived notions. And so we have this introduction and discussion to the new birth, really a discussion with Nicodemus. And hopefully, Lord willing, next week we'll be able to continue the study and, and to watch it unfold a little bit more in this conversation. But I do want us to think significantly about what it means to be born of the water and the Spirit. Without it, this is why it's so important that we understand it. Because without it, he says, no one can see the kingdom of God. And that's something we want for every individual. Now, if you have questions or concerns about this text, we certainly would love to talk to you about them. We want you to see the kingdom of God. And so if we can help you in some way, we certainly want to. Uh, reach out to us, contact us at the church office, uh, set up a time you can come in and see us, you can email us, we can video conference call, we can do whatever we need to do to make sure that we have this conversation and hopefully resolve some of these things and, and come to a biblical understanding of the text. So if we can help you, be sure to let us know and hope that you'll be with us next week um, as we continue to progress through John chapter 3.